Hey, it's Alina from the future. Uploading this video wasn't easy due to copyright issues. Therefore, it's gonna be more of an analysis than a reaction video. If you would like to check out the uncut full version of this video, you can find in the description down below my support page where you can support the channel as well as get access to exclusive content that I'll be posting. Back to the video. Hey there, it's Alina, your friendly nuclear physicist and it's the time you all have been waiting for. We are going to be reacting to the Chernobyl series starting with the first episode. So without further ado, let's get into it. What's with the God sent blue light that <laughs> was coming down from the sky? Comrade Yotla! What just happened? I don't know. This is exactly what you want to hear when you are in a nuclear power plant. What just happened? I don't know. <laughs> There's a fire in the turbine hall. So the turbine hall would be not exactly where the reactor is located. Uh, the turbine is the one that uh, basically turns and produces the uh, energy that uh, becomes electricity afterwards. That the energy that first comes from the reactor goes into the turbine that turns and converts it into mechanical energy that later on converts it into electrical energy. And uh, yeah, I guess they, they think the problem is there. What, where they are right now is the uh, control room, is the room where the operators are basically handling the reactor and everything that has to be done related to the reactor is controlled from the control room. Shut it down, but the so the control roads are roads, literally, that are made of material that is absorbing the neutrons, which are the particles that uh, basically create the fission chain reaction. So when you put them inside the reactor, either from above or from below, when you insert them inside the core, the material that they are made of absorbs the neutrons. So it kind of like kills the chain reaction because there's not enough neutrons to sustain the reaction and keep it going. And that's why they call it control roads. And when the, oh, the reactor is operational, they're inserted in like a, let's say, level that is uh, enough to maintain the reactor to be critical, to like have a chain reaction that is sustained and, and uh, produces enough energy, but at the same time that it's controlled and not, for example, goes into an explosion. So what happens here and what's usually called scrum is that when something goes wrong or the, let's say, uh, like the red button inside the control room is the button that drops the uh, control rods inside the reactor and basically kills the chain reaction so the reactor cannot uh, keep uh, producing energy by fission while, for example, a problem has happened. We're wasting time. Let's go get the hydrogen out of the... It's interesting how the person who came in and told them that the reactor core has exploded and he saw it, which means he was exposed to like the radiation that's coming out of the reactor core and he's like full on red and very strange looking, which could mean that he was exposed to very high level of radiation, but I guess nobody noticed. <laughs> so this would be actual pieces from the reactor core that are sizzling and basically like when the reactor core exploded, it, yeah, pieces fell off outside of the core and on the ground. And uh, yeah, if, if I had to assume, I would be damn sure these are pieces from the reactor core and he would know as well as the operators. So, you know, seeing how the event turned out, there was a lot of things that were, let's say, left unspoken and left like uh, unresolved when they could have done a lot of things to basically like remedy this situation. So if I had to guess based on the design of an RBMK reactor, which is the type of reactor that uh, uh, the Chernobyl power plant had, I would say that uh, these kind of like pieces of graphite, how they look like and the, the hole in between is the hole where the, where the road of the fuel was inserted in and uh, these kind of pieces basically and pieces of fuel as well um fell off and on the ground when the explosion happened and all of this is highly radioactive and all of this would be highly radioactive is it warm where's the dosimeter yeah. dosimeter for the people who might not be uh, aware is uh, would be the device that measures the level of radioactivity that exists in the environment you are present so nowadays of course it's just a small portable device looks almost like a clunky phone let's say uh, but I, I would assume back in the days it would be uh, much bigger. It's interesting to see how like because the head of the operators, the person who basically was running around in the previous scene, uh, he hasn't 
made any moves to basically like inform his people or even make them understand or aware of what's happening because he doesn't even want to believe what's happening. People who are working in the power plant, who you would assume would be the experts in what's happening, they have no idea. Like he's asking, are they bombing us? Who is bombing you? The roof of your own reactor had exploded. It's bombing you from the inside. Hey, we need to get to the reactor hall. When the lift, the, the, the lid of the, power, the reactor has been destroyed and you're going to the reactor hall where the core is, so why? To die? This is the kind of things that shows how, of course, the situation was badly managed and generally, like, these people had no guidance by their superiors. So if I, if I had to assume, I would say that this person's condition, uh, it's from the explosion, it's not from radiation or anything related to the reactor itself. I'm assuming he was very close to when the explosion happened and that's why the burn is uh, so severe and stuff. However, the dust kind of that was falling down when the second person came into the frame, that looks like dust that has radioactive materials, could look like dust that has radioactive materials in it. And of course, by him sitting there and the dust falling on his face, it's uh, increasing, of course, the the like rush on the face and the redness and the worsens the condition. So the water that he keeps mentioning all the time in the reactor core is a very important thing to do to have in the inside the reactor and it actually acts both ways. It can be positive effect of the presence of water or negative. When the presence of water is in a level that is controlled and is like the appropriate level that is supposed to be there, then uh, the radiation is contained inside the core, beside that the water, because, because <laughs> the water kind of uh, keeps the radiation inside and it doesn't let it spread as much through the uh, reactor vessel or the, the tank basically that the reactor is made out of. However, the water is also a moderator, which means it slows down the neutrons and actually increases their efficiency to cause fission. So a lot of water in the reactor could also cause even more fission reactions, which could, of course, result in a core melt. I did everything right. I think this is a very interesting, let's say, cultural thing you, one could notice is that uh, it's not, let's say, appropriate or it wasn't appropriate back in the Soviet Union times to basically um, override your superior or like say something that goes against what they believe or what they ordered you to do even though you might know that what they ordered you to do is the wrong thing to do. So it's clear from all of these people that they know that something is wrong and a lot of them have the knowledge to understand what's happening but nobody speaks up because the main person who is supposed to control the situation is the one that's denying everything. So the thing about the, the firefighters now, when he first, the operator, first uh, ordered to bring the fire department and the people were a little bit skeptical about it is because when you don't know the situation and you work in a nuclear power plant and potentially your reactor core has exploded or melted or whatever which means radioactivity is high you would not want to do that it's a priority of course to contain the situation and control the situation but at the same time you have to think about not exposing more people to radiation than the workers that are let's say, in the reactor uh, operational room and they know the risks and they signed up for it because it's their job and they are there to basically mitigate the situation. But you wouldn't want to, let's say, bring random people or civilians, even though if they are the fire department, if you know that the situation is that bad. Yes, of course, there is a fire, so it needs to be contained and it can be done from distance or from maybe helicopters or something like that. But these people seem to be very close to the, to the building that exploded, which means they are highly exposed to very, very high levels of radioactivity. Oh. So this person is actually touching a component from the reactor core, uh, which is activated. Uh, it's highly radioactive. There is a big, big dose of radiation received right now on that person's body, mostly to his hand. And if I had to assume there is be, there's gonna be severe radiation, uh, let's say burns and the damage to his skin and bone and muscle and flesh and pretty much everything. You taste metal. Yeah, what is that? I don't know. So the reason why they keep saying, do you taste metal? Do you taste metal? Is because there is metal in the atmosphere. Particle pieces of uranium is falling down because of the dust and 
of course, like you can taste, it's like metal taste. So one other thing, why I would be hesitant to call the fire department and uh, them throwing water under this situation like that, which if you don't understand exactly what's happening, you would first know, would want to know and understand what's happening is exactly why. Uh, because what is as explained before, the water can act as a moderator, can slow down neutrons, can uh, efficiently create even more fission and can actually produce energy, consequently radioactivity, the more water you throw on it. So it's not always the case that the water is the best when it comes to fire, especially when the fire is not just produced by like natural causes. But if it's a fire that's associated to radiation, then you need something that can Yes, put down the fire, but also contain the radioactivity and water is not that. As I said, this is because of the PC touch. Another thing that uh, people are usually asking is why are these operators dressed like that? They kind of look like they're chefs of <laughs> some sort. This like white attire, white hat on the head and everything is like super white and clinical. And the reason why is because uh, uranium and graphite, which are the components of the reactor that was in Chernobyl, is all kind of like gray and metallic and like dirty-like almost. So for example, when you are working somewhere, you're going, for example, to fix up something in the reactor or the power plant in general, and you get like some dust in you or some sort of contamination, be it radioactive or not, it's easier to see it. So if you all wear everything white, you can see that like you got like some stain or something, which you can see if it's like, you can measure the, the radiation level on it and see if you need to like get changed or something like that. So it's easier to identify if you have been contaminated on a white uh, kind of uh, like attire, the same way that we wear, for example, lab coats that are white, because you can see the stains immediately and you can know what happened and where you got dirty and what is it from. It's interesting how in the door it says in Russian, keep closed and they are pulling it open. This door is like so ginormous and thick is uh, because actually it's probably made of cement or concrete, also maybe with some layers of like lead inside it. And it is exactly to protect uh, the rest of the power plant, the control room, the operators from high levels of uh, radioactivity. And, what I would assume that they're entering into now is into the reactor hall, where the reactor is actually on and supposedly operating under normal conditions. I'm not sure what this is. <laughs> or if a reactor core that's burning looks like that, looks a little bit... some Hollywood sprinkle on, on this kind of uh, scene, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess they want to make it like extremely dramatic. Uh, if I had to imagine a reactor core burning or melting, that's not how I would imagine it. Uh, but yeah, you can see by their faces how it's getting like immediately red. Uh, this room, you would never want to be in, in this kind of situation. The core is exposed, there is no water inside the core, all the radiation that is being produced is just coming out in the air, and this is like... Pfft, I'd say pretty much almost instant death, <laughs> to be honest, in real life. Akimo. <laughs> Call in the day shift. So the reason why he's calling the day shift, and this is, uh, if you didn't notice, happening overnight, is like 1 a.m. And in, in the real accident, that was also the case, um, is because the day shift <laughs> is usually the people who are the more experienced, is usually the people who are operators for many years, who know how to handle situations, who they were supposed to be running this uh, test that they run in the night. Even in reality, what happened in Chernobyl, the test was supposed to be run in the morning, but there were some delays and something happened, so they had to move it on to the night and they were kind of concerned about it. And the reason why is because in the night, usually nothing much happens. And uh, people who are in the operation, in the control room in the night, are very young, usually unexperienced, usually people who are learning at the moment. And this is why, as you notice, there is a lot of young people around there. It kind of makes you think that, what are these 20-year-olds doing running around the, the reactor hall, right? And that's the reason. The reason is because, of course, people have to learn and um, they're learning when the conditions are more stable, when the situation, you know, is completely under control, the reactor is operational, 
and they're just like learning from their superiors. The day shift though is the one that runs everything that needs to be run that is out of the ordinary when it comes to the reactor operation, for example, some testing or, I don't know, some maintenance, some changes in the reactor core, which you would never see happening during the night time, and there is a reason why. How many so see, the, the hesitation of this person, uh, Akimov, to bring more people is exactly what I mentioned before, because he also knows and believes that the reactor core has exploded and is melting, and why would you want to bring even more people and basically sign their death sentence to this situation instead of trying to mitigate it by yourself and trying to do the best you can, because these people don't have you know, much left anyways. Now on the wall behind the person to the right is kind of like a kind of like a polygon of kind of shape. And this is the reactor core. And every small like round hole inside that is a, an actual physical hole in the real reactor where, would, uh, where there would be a fuel road. And the reason why they have that is so they can see, they mark exactly the fuel roads and when they were inserted or when they were uh, taken out and they can estimate how much, uh, for example, energy is produced by that particular road because it's been staying there for like longer time or less time or whatever. And next to it is exactly the same kind of uh, shape, but with buttons. And it is, for example, to push down the control roads, as we said, or like take them out. And basically they have this like visual representation of what's happening in the reactor uh, core. And in real life, it's also the same. Now, of course, the operation lo rooms look much more modern. The buttons are like more flashy and there's more screens and stuff like that, but it doesn't look that much different. So see, this is almost an hour after the accident happened, right? And what they have done for the people, nothing. So it, this kind of, you know, goes to show that if he was to accept the fact as it was, they would actually start to already take measures to protect the people and especially the people who live around the area. And uh, from the rest of the series also, I'm assuming it will be very clear that a lot of things that happened in the Chernobyl accident and the bad, like, let's say, outcome of it and why is it like the worst accident, nuclear accident that has ever happened in the world, of course, it's partly because of the reactor core exploding and the amount of radiation that was released into the atmosphere, but it is a very big piece of the the whole situation is how people treated this situation and this secrecy and this kind of... Uh, I don't know, lies and the secrets and the, how they try to like protect the situation and like not take it out there instead of actually thinking about the people and what would be best to like contain the situation and control it in the best possible way. Pills, does the hospital stock iodine pills? Iodine pills, why would we have iodine pills? Why would we have iodine pills? It comes to show how people were, let's say, misinformed and not even properly informed back in the days about the consequences of like, you know, being exposed to radiation or something like that. Iodine pills are usually uh, used and they usually exist in uh, areas where people live very close to a nuclear power plant and in case of an accident people are advised to uh, consume them. And uh, the reason why is because the thyroid in our body is the one that uh, basically like attracts and can receive the biggest amount of uh, radiation if you are exposed to radiation and iodine pills they kind of, uh, let's say, saturate these uh, nah, hormones, or I'm not a doctor, I don't know exactly how to say it, in the thyroid and make it like prevent them from absorbing the, the outside radiation. Mm. Do you see how, uh, interestingly enough, it's a, it's a detail. What I kind of like about the series is the attention to detail, first of all, of like the culture and like the lifestyle of people in the Soviet Union and second of all of these kind of small details that are let's say related to the nuclear physics and aspect of the series is the fact that they went so many stairs down to like have a meeting when you would expect them to have it like maybe I don't know in a fancy like room or something an office or something like that and it's because they are afraid that in case there is something happening and radiation is out of course they're going underground and there is like tons of concrete in between the, the ground level and the underground room that they are meeting up, so it's pretty safe to stay there. So you can kind of tell, like from the beginning, how everybody in the government or the people who are controlling the power plant, who are like the people who can actually affect the situation and do something about it, are the ones who understand that something is going on, but are in a big denial of admitting that they have done something wrong. The hydrogen tank, fire, Reactor, 
We're taking measures to ensure a steady flow of water through the core. What steady flow of water through the core? There is no core. It's, it's sad to see the people and how much, like, how little actually they were informed of the situation and uh, everything that's what's going on. Like, it's just sad to see that when they could have been saved, they didn't even have to be there if they were informed in time to just leave the place. I'm still confused about this blue tall line in the middle. Like, I get the the, the yellow color from the fire, I get the radiation, glow, everything. What's with that tall skyscraper height blue line? Maybe somebody can explain that to me. Yeah, so this is the dust, is uh, what we call in the nuclear physics uh, radioactive fallout. And it's when an explosion happens, radioactive material is released into the air and then it falls down. And while it falls down, because it's light, it's like dust particles, it can travel with the wind and the air. So if the wind blows to a certain direction, it can go there. And this is how, actually, after the Chernobyl accident, a lot of radiation did travel around to other countries. And uh, yeah, it's sad that they are, of course, in the bridge, which is like so high up and exposed and covered by nothing. Like if you were in a house or in a building, things would be much better. Now they're just like out in the open and of course this falls on them and it's radioactive. It of course will cause skin irritation, it will cause other problems and there's kids there and yeah. We need to start making our way to the roof. Wow. They're gonna go even closer to that. All of these people are just pretty much dead. Sadly. It's like... That's the problem when you don't know, like, your fire department uh, that works close to a nuclear power plant and nobody has informed you, like, about, for example, what to do in case of a fire. But, I mean, to be honest, people don't even admit that the reactor core has melted or something like that, that these people, of course, wouldn't know. Like, they wouldn't be instructed even to do so. It's pointless because no matter how much water you're putting there, you could stand there all day and it would still be the same thing. It would not make any difference. You would not make the... Uh, material that is around you any less radioactive, you will not contain radioactivity in any way. If anything, you make things worse and you'll just kill even more people. What about the auxiliary? The auxiliary system is uh, basically like a secondary water system that is uh, there for cooling in case the main cooling system fails. And that's why he asked how about the auxiliary, but I'm assuming because of the explosion, basically all the pumps are just out of order right now. I would assume these, all of these people are the people from the morning shift. So <laughs> you can tell the difference. Gentlemen, welcome. 5 a.m., five hours past the explosion. Nobody has started the evacuation yet. Please, uh, find a seat. Like, I, I kind of get these people. They are trying to help. They have like the, let's say the general public's best interest at heart. But still, instead of trying to understand the situation, and just pumping water into a reactor core that you don't know the state of it might result in even worse outcome than the one that is right now. So it might even be better just leave it as it is if you don't know what the situation is. So now he came out and I, hopefully he can see it that the people outside of the power plant and far away from the reaction are actually uh, showing so severe symptoms, meaning that the radiation in the atmosphere is much higher than they estimated inside the power plant. And yeah, so clearly it's not just the feed water, which is just the water flowing through uh, the reactor core that it's mildly contaminated. I feel so sorry for this person. And these people are still scolding him and like blaming him as if he's the one who's like responsible or, you know, at fault for the situation. All of these fumes, all of this smoke, all of this is carrying radioactive materials that is spreading far from just Ukraine. And that has been it for this episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe and comment down below what you thought and generally your opinions about the Chernobyl series and the situation that actually occurred in real life. It's been Alina, your friendly nuclear physicist and until next time, see you soon.